Welcome everyone to Who's Who and is Aviation and Weather, a program where I speak with some of the most influential and prominent people in the aviation and weather industries. This is your host, Dr. Scott Denstead. Well, I'm thrilled to have Mark Robodeau on the program with me. Hey, Mark, thanks for sharing, uh, taking the time to share your expertise and knowledge with us today. Hey, Scott, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Good. So if you don't know Mark, he's, a found, he's the founder and president of a very popular um, website called pilotworkshops.com. Uh, he holds a commercial pilot certificate with instrument and seaplane ratings. And Mark and I actually go way back, almost 20 years, because I think we've had similar aspirations to help pilots make better decisions and fly safe through online content. Is that about sum it up? Yeah, I, absolutely. I, th I, I think we started about the same time. Yeah I, I, yeah, I got my instructor certificate back in the late 90s and started uh, teaching um, in-person kind of stuff. And then eventually I said, you know what, I need to switch this out of the in-person world to the online world. Right. And, um, and I don't know when you and I, I don't know if you reached out to me or I reached out to you, but we're kind of trying to do the same thing. Uh, yeah, I remember specifically we were, uh, we were coming out with a new product, our, our first uh, course, online course. Um, in 2007, I think it was 2006, 2007, it was called IFR proficiency. Right. And I said, well, one of the biggest, you know, we're going to need to get somebody in here that's a weather expert. So I, I forget exactly how I was introduced to you, but, uh, I reached out to you and said, Hey Scott, would, would you be interested in participating? And, and you did, and that's going on 18 years ago. So it's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while, but, uh, and, and certainly it's been some, you know, you know, valleys and, and, um, and hills to climb overall throughout this whole thing. And, you know, some good and bad times, so to speak, because I know for a while there, if I remember right, uh, you know, things weren't necessarily going, going out there as quickly as, as the case may be, because you came from the, um, the commercial industry or, you know, essentially. Right. And eventually enter, entered into this space, um, kind of unknowing what to expect. Yeah, I, I started the business in 2005, and I had about 20 years in the software industry before mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, we were anything but an overnight success. Uh, <laughs> so I did it full time for about two years, and then decided, you know, I it's really not to the level where I can sustain myself here. So I, you know, I need to go back to the software business, and uh, which I did. Um, so that was about 2007. Um, but the thing is, I, I went back for, it was ended up being about three years. I went back and, you know, to a full-time career in the software business, but I kept pilot workshops going on the side and I just started to put all the, all the money back into the business since I didn't need any to, to live off. Um, so that three years where I just put all the money back into the business and invested in products and invested in, you know, building our, our list and our channel and our brand and everything. Um, that's really what turned it around. And so in 2011, I got to the point where I said, man, I could, I could probably do this full time again. You know, of course I was a little reluctant because I had already <laughs> left the software industry once, but, uh, yeah, so I've been doing it full time since 2011 and, uh, we've had a, a great growth trajectory over those years. Yeah, you have. I mean, I, I, I watched you kind of outside looking in, watched you uh, go through that ebb and flow of, you know, and, I, and I've been in that, that situation myself many times and, and you finally either get it or you continue to just scrape along for a while. But I've uh, been watching you guys and, and, uh, and how well you've kind of pulled pull all this together. And certainly in the last five to 10 years, when I go, I just got back from Sun and Fun. I can't tell you how many people that come by and say, Oh yeah, Scott, Scott, yeah, you're, you're the guy that's on pilot workshops, right? So they've <laughs> right. heard about me through you in many cases, or they've bought a program where I was part of, uh, in that sense, right. or maybe I was part of the round table discussion right. uh, at that time. So yeah, it was, if from that standpoint, it's been, uh, it's been good, a good relationship, at least for me, uh, to be part of at least part of your organization. Um, even if I'm not, you know, full time with you guys. Yeah. And, 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 all of our instructors, we don't we don't have any full time flight instructors. Well, we have full time flight instructors that work in the company, building the products and mm -hmm. servicing our customers and so forth. Um, but we don't the people that contribute to the to the programs, the subject matter experts, if you will, they're all contractors. So 
Um, you know, and, and our goal or our, our model has always been to find the best person we can to present whatever topic we're, you know, we're, we're going after. Um, so that's how we, we found you when it came to weather. We were like, who's the best person to do weather? And there was nobody that had your experience, both as a flight instructor, um, you know, and as a, a CFWI. Mm -hmm. So whether it's, you know, IFR training, um, stick and rudder, uh, basic VFR, uh, backcountry, you know, all that stuff. We always say, who's the best person to, to teach this? And we go find the best person. And uh, so that model has been really good. It's been, it's been fun to build the business that way. Yeah, and you meet a lot of people, a lot of interesting people in the industry. Um, you know, like you said, from uh, everyone flying VFR, IFR, looking at uh, air traffic controllers, weather at experts, you know, even the possibility of getting in the psychology of, of aviation in terms of what it means and, and overall the business of aviation. Um, I know I've always told people that don't get into the aviation industry because it's really hard to make a buck. Um, but. But you guys have actually done pretty well overall, and I, I know you've got a good base of, of folks. And, and the way you did it was really smart. You have basically a lot of people who are signed up for your free stuff, if you will. And ultimately, they come and look at and say, you know, this, this guy knows his stuff, or this, I heard this instructor talk about this topic. Before you know it, they're purchasing other products. So tell us a little bit about kind of the, the background of how you got interested in aviation you know, what 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 uh, what was it that you said? Hey, I want to fly. What kind of interested you in that area? Yeah, I remember the, the exact day actually. <laughs> um, I I had no aviation background at all. I didn't I didn't come from a flying family. Um, you know, I really had no exposure to general aviation into my late twenties. Um, and a friend of mine got his private pilot certificate and said, "Hey, um, love to take you for a ride mm -hmm. in an airplane." So I'm thinking, okay, sounds interesting. Um, so he rented a, a Cessna 172. We flew mm -hmm. from uh, Hampton, New Hampshire, which is a beautiful grass field, or at least it was at the time they've since paved it, but um, it's on the coast of New Hampshire. And we flew up to Bar Harbor, Maine. And um, so I was a little apprehensive to get in a small plane, never been in one. So we, we crawled in, we took off and flew to Bar Harbor. And it was just like a perfect day. It was blue skies no wind i mean just as good as it gets mm -hmm. we flew to bar harbor um had lunch and then we, we flew back and we were fl flying back in there in the early evening i was in the right seat and i'm watching the main coast kind of go by me you know right out my window um he gave me you know let me do a little bit of flying on the way back and uh and man i was completely hooked at that point it was one <laughs> flight and i was i was into it so the next morning i woke up and uh drove as fast as I could to the local flight school, signed up for lessons and have never looked back. So that was, that was the day that I get into flying for sure. Right. And then now you're, you got flying, you know, in your blood. Um, right. In that sense, it's a, and I had a similar type of situation. I was basically doing software engineering. I was working as a meteorologist, uh, doing a lot of different applications in weather, uh, as well as other, other non-weather related applications. But a couple of them were, in, you know, into, I did some air traffic control applications, airport surveillance radar, applications and you know that was always there in the back of my mind that hey i i love this aviation kind of stuff and i've always wanted to fly you know when all the kids in my class in high school were all wanted to be astronauts and all that kind of stuff i wanted to be a hurricane hunter and so that's i wanted to go and learn you know about weather and learn about flying i never did get that hurricane hunters uh, license so to speak uh but um but it interested me enough that when i was in my uh, uh kind of early 40s um, or I mean, actually late, late 30s, I had said, you know what, I'm not getting any younger, so I'm going to go ahead and, and do this flying thing. And right. with, with the notion that I would never be, have this as my primary job, right? but I loved it so much and you know, I had the same thing where I had very little, I had a fair amount of cash that I could play with, but I, it was conservative and didn't want to throw it all into a business and have it you know, literally tank. But it, right. eventually I, I, I st stopped working full time and, and I came up with a, a solution to try to do this weather and aviation thing together and hooked up with folks like yourself as well as others, uh, learn more about the industry. And, you know, here I am uh, and, and both of us kind of have that same mentality. So ultimately, what out of all the products you sell, essentially, what is the product that most people want to purchase? 
Um, you know, so we have a lot of courses and manuals. Um, I think our best selling manual to date is the uh, IFR procedures manual, um, followed closely by airplane engines. Those are our two biggest selling manuals. They all sell really well. It, it was interesting because the manuals I didn't have, I had low expectation for them. Hmm. Um, we, I don't know if you remember ZD Publishing, John Dittmer. Oh yeah. He, John was the founder of ZD Publishing. And um, so he, you know, he was writing these manuals for Garmin and Bendix King equipment, basically, you know, GPS training uh, manuals. And he has had this pilot friendly um, format that he used. And I remember we went to a trade show and he had the booth next to us. And we just had a steady stream of pilots coming by all day saying, man, John, I love your manuals. Mm. These are they're great. Um, and they were really well done. So anyway, we, we, we purchased that company. We purchased John's company, ZD Publishing, when he was looking to get out probably about 10 years ago. But now we've taken the whole pilot-friendly brand and we've done things like airplane engines, um, you know, IFR communications, VFR communications, uh, emergencies. We've taken that sort of uh, pilot-friendly format and expanded it out. But what's interesting is pilots still love to get something in the mail. Yeah. You know, we offer the manuals as a PDF only. You can save a bunch of money, but they'd rather spend more money and get it in the mail. Um, so anyway, those are our manuals. Um, our courses, they all sell pretty pretty much the same. Um, you know, we have a lot of people that were repeat buyers. So if they take one of our courses and they like it, they'll buy, they'll buy all of them or what, what, anything that they're interested in. So our courses are good sellers, but uh, the mastery series is really probably our where we get the most notoriety. Mm -hmm. um, the monthly VFR mastery and IFR mastery series is th are, are the programs that people relate to the most. And like when I was at Sun and Fun last week, um, when people come up to me and say, "Hey, I you know I really love pilot workshops," the first thing they mention is mastery, mm -hmm. IFR mastery, VFR mastery. So that's the program I think that we're most known for. Um, but yeah, we've got. God, I think we've got 10 or 12, oh no, 11 courses and 12 manuals. So, as well as IFR and VFR mastery. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great set of, of programs overall. It's not too specific. It's, it has a wide range of topics, which means that you're going to get, you know, folks that are just going to be VFR pilots or bush pilots that are not going to do much of any kind of IFR flying in their life. Or you'll get people that are these go-getters that literally cross the country, you know, a couple times a month, um, you know, doing hard IFR kind of stuff. And therefore, they want to be, they want to understand the system that they're operating in um, as good as they can possibly do it. And the products, especially when you start getting into the Mastery Series, there's a lot of great topics to cover that you can have multiple you know, no, no particular topic has a right or wrong answer in many cases. Yes, there's, you have to go through and you have to make sure that you understand the rules and regulations you're operating under. And there's certain de facto standards, like you don't fly into a, a thunderstorm. But right. from the standpoint of everybody's opinion about how to deal with, with uh, aviation, I know I've uh, come full circle on a lot of different uh, topics in aviation where I felt that I, I thoroughly understood it and then I started learning more and like maybe I don't understand this quite quite as well as I should. I start digging into it a little bit more deeper understanding and then at some point in time I come out with this little you know uh, epiphany that says wow I've been understanding this stuff wrong all along right and then I can teach it better to pilots but ultimately you'll have to you have to go through a, a, a learning process and without having that discussion um, and certainly having all those instructors that you have as part of your uh, series, uh, that represents a great opportunity f to hear all these different uh, uh, ways to deal with the same issues. Yeah, and I, the interesting thing is when we do these roundtable discussions with the instructors, and you've sat on mm -hmm. many of them, um, most of the time there's not consensus. They don't all agree on the best option, right? So we'll typically, with the Mastery Series, we'll give four or five options, how would you continue this flight, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and there's very, very infrequently is there consensus. Most of the time there's a couple camps of, di of different ways that they'd approach it. And the, the round tables are interesting because that's where people get sometimes a little bit spirited in their discussions <laughs> and debate. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, every pilot has a different tolerance for risk, for example. And every pilot has a different, let's say, skill set based on where they're at in that particular 
point in time in their flying journey. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what happens is they'll people typically relate to somebody on the panel. Mm -hmm. um, they'll say, "Oh yeah, Wally Moran." You know, I, he, I, I always, I always agree with Wally, or I, Dave Hirschman, or mm -hmm. whoever it is. You know, and so um, that I think that's important to have is is, is a perspective that there's different ways of doing things. And what we really go into in the mastery series is on uh, the gray areas. Mm -hmm. It's not so black and white. There's a lot of there's a lot of decisions you have to make when you're flying IFR, especially. We, and um, so that's what we really explore, and uh, it makes for some fun discussion for sure. Yeah, it does. I you know the, I don't mind the, uh, the the occasional tense discussion here and there, as long as we're not attacking people and attack, you know, attacking the uh, the concept and idea. But right. in the but in the end. You know, you get uh, you know fr from a standpoint of especially when you're dealing with IFR and weather. I know there are a, a ton of folks that when they they think about IFR and weather, they don't think it much different than regular VFR flying. And certainly VFR has its challenges, but when you're in the system, you don't get the same ability just to go wherever you want in VFR. You can just go any essentially anywhere as long as you obey all the airspace requirements. But right. IFR, you have to really work and work as a team, and it's it's. It's amazing how many people, when you, you interview uh, certain people, especially when I'm sitting there uh, either at Sun and Fun or at Air Venture talking to various different pilots, you get an appreciation that, you know, it, there is a ton of gray areas. You know, they may say, hey, I'm flying out in the, the, the LAX area. We don't do that stuff that you guys do back east. Uh, if we did that, we would be really in big trouble. Or we have to deal with these constant, you know, uh, uh, cases where you have these low IFR conditions, the uh, you know, marine layer moves in, you know, and you go to somebody else who's in the Midwest where they don't understand what a marine layer is at all. So right. part of it is also the geography of what you how you what you're dealing with here, and I think that comes into play too when you're when you're going through these discussions. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you know, even just weather as a specific topic. I mean, think of how many thousands of hours of training you've provided over the years. And, you know, that's so valuable to people flying IFR, the different, you know, programs that you've put out there. Um, you know, th those are, those are super, you know, invaluable to pilots that are flying IFR. Um, and, but then beyond that, there are so many other types of topics we can get into. Um, we just published our 163rd monthly IFR scenario, wow. which is mind-boggling yeah um and then we launched vfr mastery in 2018 and we just launched our i think we're on like 65 or 66 so it every time i think we're running out of topics it's <laughs> it's never the case um we have we've already written and we're you know putting together the scenarios for the next 12 months right now and uh you know there's just based on weather and how complex it is and all the variables that you encounter in flying, there's really no shortage of, of different material and content you can cover. So yeah, that's uh, good for guys like us, right? That's right. <laughs> They're in business. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It keeps us in, in business. Yeah, weather, I always, uh, you know, in, there's many cases where I've been writing a lot of articles. I'm writing for Flying Magazine now. And, um, you know, running out of topics is not the problem. It's really, right. and, you know, and running out of topics that is, is you know, applicable to, to pilots is not the problem. I, I think the, the issue that I have mostly is, is writing uh, either a, an article or designing a particular workshop or even as I'm writing my books is to write it so that people can understand it. Um, and right. so you don't want to talk over their head. And I know I've been uh, judged many times that sometimes I'll throw a topic out there. It's a little bit too technical for the average pilot. But you know, my goal is to try to take that that uh, that topic or idea and elevate it to the next level. Because as you as you know, you you know, and probably the reason why you got into what you're doing is that when you probably first started learning to fly, and certainly as you were getting into the instrument world, a lot of the products that were out there were really basic stuff. You know, I'm not going right. to trash AOPA because I think they provide a valuable resource to pilots. But a lot of the material they provide. It's, it's as if it's like, you know, is the, you know, when you go to uh, get help for your computer, they say, is it plugged in? You know, that kind of level of information. And certainly, you know, my goal is to, is to take that, that basic, L, that basic uh, level of knowledge that most pilots should have and put them to the next level. Maybe not way up here, but certainly get them to the next level. And I'm sure you probably found similar uh, situations with a lot of the products you put out. 
Yeah, and uh, one thing I will say about your product, so you typically, you, you, make the, you always make them modular so that you can go as deep as you want, right? So I think you do a really good job of, if you just want to get enough, if you just want enough information to, to keep yourself out of trouble, here it is. If you really want to explore weather at a much deeper level, you provide that too and you layer it on nicely. Um, when, when we started the business, uh, the reason I started the business, going back to what you said, it was 2003, I had just gotten my instrument rating. And, um, you know, I passed the check ride. I got a good, good score on the written. Everything's great. I get my rating and I'm like, I'm, I'm not comfortable flying. I have, who, who are they kidding? You know, I don't deserve the certificate. So, um, I started looking for stuff, like just proficiency. Like how can I fill in all these gaps I have? I mean, I could sit there and fly the same handful of approaches all day. Cause I've gotten good at that. Um, I can do attitude instrument flying. Um, but. I can't, you know, there's so much more to know in the system. So anyway, I, I started the business because it solved the problem that I figured hadn't been solved, which is nobody had really gone after pure pilot proficiency training at that point, mm -hmm. especially in the yeah. IFR world. And so I felt like that was an opportunity. And, um, it was, it was one of those classic cases of, I, I built a company because I wanted to have it, I wanted to be their customer and, and have right. this information available. So that's really what drove us to, to get into this market. And really, I think we've, we've definitely established ourselves as one of the leaders, if not the leader in, you know, pure pilot proficiency over the years. But yeah. it was this, just like you said, it was, a, it was a, the same thing drove me to get into this. Yeah. And it's, it's a, it's a re rewarding kind of industry to be in because especially since I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one training with pilots, uh, you know, I, I stopped doing my in-person workshops. I do presentations to groups and stuff, uh, or do presentations in um, Oshkosh and Sun and Fun and stuff. But ultimately, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one kind of training, and and it's really really cool to be able to see the light bulbs go off. Um, you know, they've they've got this basic knowledge, in some cases, knowledge that may not be perfectly set, uh, you know, correctly. You know, I, I start to probe their, their knowledge base and realize they, they were taught improperly or they learned it improperly. But eventually I get, I get to a point where I can see those light bulbs go off. And then typically, you know, maybe two weeks, two months, maybe even two years later, they come back and say, Scott, you know what? I remember when you taught me about this. And I, I, was, okay. going, I was going to go through this area and I, it was showery precipitation, no thunderstorms. And lo and behold, there was an aircraft accident at the airport and I, you know, it was just a shower and it wasn't a big thunderstorm. It was all because they got into a downdraft. And, and so the, ultimately, it's nice to be able to see and get a feedback of you know, just how all the training that you've done over the years actually helps people. Right, and I'm sure they could hear your voice you know, as, <laughs> they, were, as they were approaching that weather. Yeah. We, get, we get letters and, um, and emails all the time from, from customers you know, and I'm not the instructor, so I don't want to take any credit for this. Right. But some of the content that our instructors put out there is, is, is absolutely saved lives. We've had many an email and, and letter from people that say, hey, thank God I learned this from you because I, I almost got myself into trouble, but I didn't because of what I picked up from whatever training pro program they had gone through at the time. So, yeah, those are always re rewarding. It reminds us why we're doing this. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, it's it's nice to impact pilots in a positive way that way. Yeah, and you've been able to attract, I think, a lot of good uh, a lot of good people overall, and and uh, certainly your team has put out uh, a ton of really good uh, information to pilots on a um, on a scale that is easily, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of people I'm sure have heard about you and certainly are part of your uh, your your um, engaging in your products on a regular basis. So if we look into the future, um, whether it's through pilot workshops or through other mechanism, where do you see this going? Um, do you see any, have you spent any time thinking about what's gonna happen with pilot workshops in 10, you know, 15, 20 years from now? You know, I mean, I, I think we're just gonna keep doing what we do because we've, we've, we've perf we haven't perfected it, but we've really honed in on this kind of uh, structure that we now use to build our manuals and build our courses and produce the mastery. Cause you know, you figure mastery, we produce two major courses every month, starting mm -hmm. with mastery, right? So we've gotten really good at it. And now we can just feed new ideas 
into the into the machine and out comes a training program um i don't not that it's that easy but because of the way we've templatized it and structured it and organized it so i i see us continuing to do what we do um i'd like to try to reach more pilots i mean the one of the challenges is in this market i mean there's probably 250,000 active ga pilots yeah. maybe um we reach over 200,000 of them mm -hmm. so you know, and of course, there's always new new people coming in. Um, also, the people, the, the, some of the younger people that are getting into aviation, going on the career track, those aren't probably our best prospects because mm -hmm. I think they just want to go to the airlines and get trained. They're not right. really interested in, in our stuff. But um, but we'll keep, continue to try and expand our brand. Um, we'll we'll do partnerships with companies that we think have products and services that that fit well with what we do. Uh, I want to do more of that. Um, the other thing is, I think there's an opportunity to, to really, because, you know, because we, we can only go so far with online courses, but I think the next thing is to kind of take it to the next level with simulation. Oh, wow, yeah. And so it would be interesting if somebody could go through an IFR mastery scenario and then fly it on their simulator. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to, I don't know what the exact numbers are. I'm guessing like 30% if that of our of general aviation pilots are using simulation on a regular basis have a simulator at home so hopefully that number continues to grow and uh and we can take advantage of that and then even doing more live events i know you've done a bunch of them in the past we ran these ifr boot camps for a while um out of our office here in new hampshire we had a bunch of simulators set up we brought people in for like a three-day um really intensive ifr training session which was a combination of lectures and, and scenarios flown in the sim and people loved it uh so i'd like to potentially do more of that um and who knows maybe take advantage of some emerging technologies that, I'm, that we're, we're not even aware of yet yeah i know it's uh, it's incredible um i went to sun and fun and it was lots and lots of simulators showed up there uh whether it was some of these personal uh aircraft vehicles that you can have a uh, little you know, uh, drones that people fly around essentially, and and, and certainly the drone, um, you know, technology and, and those folks that fly drones on a regular basis is another source of potential. I get right. folks all the time coming to me saying, you know, Scott, I, I fly a lot of drones, you know, at or below 400 feet, and weather is obviously something I need to be concerned about. And so, you know, do you have any products and training for that particular area? And I haven't specialized in that. But I do like your idea. I mean, with virtual reality, all the VR stuff going on, right. uh, it's amazing how, uh, I would say easy it is, but ultimately if you can set this up right, and if you can, especially you guys, where you have a pretty good set of templates to follow, I can only imagine that you know, setting up a template for that kind of thing could boost a lot more people to be able to do this um, on a, on a, uh, in a virtual reality kind of scenario. Right. Yeah, I mean, I... I we, we took a we, we put out a course called the instrument rating accelerator where we took a private pilot we took him all the way through the instrument rating this was during covid 2020 we took him all the way through getting an instrument rating and uh, he was on he was on a simulator in his basement the whole time wow and we had ryan cook who's our instructor in you know in his home office on his simulator and he took him through the whole instrument rating um all the flying aspects of it anyway and then we finished it off we had doug stewart do a, a, a simulated check ride with with uh with the uh the the uh the student pilot so it was it was interesting but it showed that and, and doug passed him by the way okay. he said you know, he didn't get a rating but he said that he did pass if he would have given him a passing grade and he had never stepped into an airplane that was all done over simulators i mean he had his private pilot but he had never the instrument training was all done on the simulator so i think there's a lot more that can be done there um with simulation, with online training, with you know, manuals, um, you know, monthly scenario-based training, all that sort of stuff could converge, I think, and, and continue to grow together. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing what uh, you can do nowadays, even with weather, uh, setting up weather scenarios, with the ability to capture real weather scenarios and put pilots into situations where, so okay, now what do you do? Um, and this is right. not something that's on a piece of paper where you flip the page to see what the next you know image looks like this is actually happening in, in somewhat real time in front of you 
and it mimics what happens in real life. And so ultimately you can have an instructor or have somebody else back there watching the, the student make those choices. Uh, I've always right. thought that one of the things I would like to eventually get into is the ability to, um, to watch people how they do their pre-flight planning. So it's not just about, you know, um, here's, your, here's your flight plan, see ya, and, and you go flying, but also, you know, watch the process a pilot goes through. And I get to do that when I do one-on-one -on -one training. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll throw a pilot into a situation. Okay, we're going to be making a trip in three days from this, air, this airport to this airport in your airplane. Tell me a little bit about what you see in the weather. And they'll, they'll be able to give me some feedback about what some of the things that they're looking at, some of the things that bother them, certainly some of the things that are acceptable to them. But in the end, are they making really good decisions based on what they see, or are they missing things that are important? So I think really uh, having simulations or having the ability, especially to have somebody looking over your shoulder to know what right. you're doing is correct, because the last thing you want to do is have somebody say, oh, here's a simulator, just go have fun, and not really be doing things properly, really need to have that oversight. Right, and, and I, absolutely. It's interesting that you do the uh, look over the shoulder briefings. Um, I guess I, I have a question for you, which is, okay. you know, <laughs> a lot of the, uh, the the trends lately show that we're making some progress on on aviation safety. Mm -hmm. Right, a lot of the, the bad the bad numbers are going down. Um, do you feel like the in cockpit weather that's available to pilots and all the planning tools? Do you think that's having a big impact on that? I think it's keeping us out of certain um, certain accidents, but it's not helping us in the VFR and the IMC problem. Right. And that is, what we're seeing is we're still seeing many, too many pilots that are taking off, um, and usually these are VFR pilots, um, but ultimately they're taking off, they get really good weather at their departure airport, they may have some pretty good understanding with the weather at their destination. It's all that weather in between that's, that's causing them angst and all, also allowing them to you know, get themselves into trouble. Uh, and, and for the most part, those kind of accidents are high, highly uh, deadly. In other words, you get into a, you know, if, if the NTSB report says VFR and IMC, uh, typically that means you died in that particular accident. Right. And so that's right. the tough one to deal with. But I do think we're getting a little bit, pushing the envelope a little bit f further into the positive area with respect to staying away from convection or thunderstorms. Right. Now there's, there's not, I mean, there's not a lot of excuse these days to stumble into a thunderstorm. That's um, right. With with the information we have available at our fingertips, it's it's incredible. I, I don't know what we ever did without it. I know really. that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> good to go, Mark. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time and energy and and, and sitting with me and talking all you know, about the good times and bad times of uh, of our uh, of our history in terms of in the aviation industry. Right. No, my pleasure, Scott. I always uh, enjoy talking with you.